Welcome to Legal Toolkit, bringing you the latest legal trends and business initiatives to help you manage your law firm with your host, Jared Correa. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the award-winning Legal Toolkit podcast here on the Legal Talk Network. If you were looking for the best version of Scooby-Doo, might I suggest Mystery Incorporated? as a dark horse choice. It's really good. And after 40 years, I still can't pronounce horse correctly. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. If you're a first-time listener, hopefully you'll become a long-time listener. As always, I'm your show host, Jared Correa, and you should also know that I have Duke Silver's full discography on vinyl. That, and in addition to casting this pod, I am the CEO of Red Cave Law Firm Consulting, which offers subscription-based law practice management consulting services for law firms, bar associations, and legal vendors. Check us out at redcavelegal.com. And then I'm the COO of Guinean Software, Inc., which offers chatbots, chatbot builders, and predictive analytics created specifically for law firms. Find out more at www.gideon.legal. Lastly, you can listen to my other, other podcast, The Lobby List, a family travel show I host with my wife, Jessica, on iTunes. Subscribe, rate, and comment. But here on The Legal Toolkit, This podcast, we provide you twice each month with a new tool to add to your own legal toolkit so your practices will become more and more like best practices. In this episode, we're going to talk about paid online advertising for law firms. But before I introduce today's guests, that's right, people, we have multiple guests today. Two guests. Let's take a moment to thank our sponsors, without whom none of this podcasting goodness would be possible. Abby Connect has delivered premium live receptionist and answering services to lawyers since 2006. You can try them out for free at abbyconnect.com. Scorpion crushes the standard for law firm online marketing with proven campaign strategies to get attorneys better cases from the internet. Partner with Scorpion to get an award-winning website and ROI-positive marketing programs today. Visit scorpionlegal.com forward slash podcast. Nexa formerly known as Answer One, is a leading virtual receptionist and answering service provider for law firms. Learn more by giving them a call at 800-267-9371 or online at www.nexa.com. TimeSolve is the number one web-based time and billing software for lawyers, providing solutions since 1999. TimeSolve provides the most comprehensive billing features for law firms big and small. www.timesolve.com. All right, as I said, we've got two guests today, and we're going to get into this thing hard like Jim Levenstein gets into an apple pie. My first guest is Jake Sanders of Consult Webs. Jake is a content custodian and a co-host of the Lawsom podcast, which in many respects is really quite awesome. You should listen to it. Jake worked for many years as a digital marketing coordinator and as a marketing director at a personal injury law firm before launching his own marketing consulting agency and then joining Consult Webs, where he is today. So, Jake, welcome to the big show, my friend. Thank you so much for having me today. I know this must be a personal life goal of yours, so I'm happy to <sighs> I've be achieved able it. To... Well, it's, it's hard when you peak this early, but I'm, I'm ready to embrace the downward slope after this. Excellent. My next guest, always on the upward slope, Paul Julius, also of Consult Webs, and also a co-host of the Lawsome Podcast. As marketing manager at Consult Webs, Paul has spent the last five years working with lawyers and law firms and the last 10 years managing and optimizing AdWords, Bing, social, and other paid marketing campaigns. So it sounds like he's a perfect fit for this show topic. Paul, welcome to the show as well. Thank you. Thanks for having us here. All right. Shall we jump in? I think we should jump in. Let's do it. Jake, I want to talk to you first. You're the okay. only white guy I know who hangs out with Big Daddy Kane. And like, that's a real thing. That's on your bio. Um, yeah. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about that? And then can you also tell me, because I feel like you should know, which member of New Edition is your favorite member of New Edition? Um, well, yeah. So so there's a he, Big Daddy Kane lets a couple white people hang out with him a just year. A few. It's yeah. sort of like a Hunger Games. And, um, you know, I just kind of got to the backpack first. Um, no, I lived in New York and he was recording an album at a studio that I was rehearsing at. Um, and one of the engineers knew that I was a baritone saxophone player. And he said, do you want to come and play on the Kane album? And I said, yeah. 
and I went to this studio in Brooklyn, and in the studio is Big Daddy Kane. And people don't know who Big Daddy Kane is. When I tell people, I, I play with Big Daddy Kane, they're like, who? They don't understand he's the Benjamin Franklin of rap. I mean, he's the founding forefather of hip hop. So, but but that goes over like my Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn jokes. I mean, it's getting to a point where people don't know <laughs> <laughs> the cool references, and I'm like, well, I think I'm getting old. Um, yeah, Kane's great. I always think I often think of that. Is it that people don't know the cool references, or am I not I, cool anymore? I'm I'd just like to think the former is true. I think it's an old soul kind of mentality. There's somebody yes. out there that's like, I get your Donna Reed references. But the, the point is, with, with that's even older. But Kane, we played the Essence Festival in 2015 with New Edition. No. Um, really? Yes. Oh, that's and amazing. And so we're backstage, and everybody else who I don't know in New Edition is waiting for Bobby Brown. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, he's, he's got it, the drugs, right? Well, yeah, who knows if he's going to be here. So the whole <laughs> time backstage, they're wondering – is Bobby going to show up? Is Bobby going to show up? And I, I, I asked Kane, I said, do you think Bobby Brown is going to show up? He's like, I don't know, man. You know, <laughs> boom, out of nowhere, five minutes before they go on, Bobby Brown shows up in sweatpants, <laughs> a, a full right. matching sweatsuit, goes on stage and kills it and comes back and just like disappears again. It, 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 was, it was really bizarre. Um, so my favorite is Bobby because he's the only one I can remember. And he's the closest <laughs> to an actual magician, um, so that that that's the way I that's the way I I answer that one. Yeah, I feel like I enjoy the Bobby Brown lifestyle, like sweats, and then you knock it out of the park. That's how Just you do show it. up. But everybody's wondering: Are you going to do it? Is it going to happen? Will yeah. it happen? Yeah. And then you just. I mean, it was crazy when he went on stage, everybody lost their minds um, <laughs> because it's Bobby Brown. He's in a sweatsuit. It doesn't matter. Anyway. Yeah, Bobby Brown's great. I, I would have to say Bobby Brown as well, but I'm, I'm kind of a low-key Ralph Tresvant fan, actually. See? He, he, has, See? he had a pretty good solo album back in the day. But, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's just, um, how could you pick, you know, when, when one of them is so obviously amazing to look at? Like, you can't stop thinking about Bobby it's Brown. True. It's so. true. Somebody's got to be the dude, and Bobby yep. Brown's the dude. That's right. Shall we pay some bills? What do you think, guys? Let's do the it. Let's the pay sponsors. The bills. So, I know this may be a surprise, but the sponsors probably don't want us to talk about New Jack Swing for an hour. So, um, <laughs> Paul, uh, can you? I, talk was ab- to I was about to expound on Bell Biv DeVoe, but okay, uh, you can you can if you want. Like, let's hit Bell Biv DeVoe for a sec, and then like, <laughs> why don't you after that? Talk to me about what digital advertising is and where law firms would place such digital advertising. Sure. sure. True, true. Well, I, I certainly appreciate, um, you know, New Edition. I, I was more appreciative of, of the side projects and stuff, but I, I agree with what you guys were BBD saying. BBD is yeah. the real deal, man. That's a good I mean, that, totally. good album as well. That's the real deal. I dig it. I dig it. Um, so, yeah. So, digital advertising, though. Let's uh, let's steer this back onto the, the main road here. <laughs> Perfect segue, um, right? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> you know. Um, so digital advertising, the way I look at it, people have lots of different definitions of, of what people can do online, stuff like that. I look at it as, um, a very broad thing where anywhere you can buy a spot, right? So, you know, on, on Google search results or somebody shares a post or something like that on Twitter, um, that's not something you bought. That's, that's more of organic. That's, that's something else. So digital advertising is more, you know, people are familiar with like Google ads or Bing, um, or buying a banner ad or a social ad on Facebook, something like that. To me, that's digital advertising. Anywhere I can buy an impression, um, be it a, a you know a native post with a you know sponsored content or a, you know a display ad or anything like that. That's that's where it's at. Gotcha. Okay, that's good. So we have definitions, a framework to work with. So Jake, let's turn to you now. So now that we know mm-hmm. what this is, like. Yes. Can you tell me what some specific digital marketing assets would be, as well as some campaigns that you've had success with, just to give people some grounding on like what they can do with this? Sure. I mean, you know, really the main goal of advertising is to get exposure for your brand. And I think a lot of people approach advertising as a direct response vehicle. So I think you have to think two different realities is that there's branded advertising and then there's direct response advertising so and i don't know if everybody knows what direct response advertising is so if you want to drop that knowledge 
So brand advertising is just do it. Brand advertising is is a brand message. Direct response is 10% off this Wednesday. You know, bring girls get in free. Um, that's <laughs> that that you're causing a response with your advertising messages. And a lot of people who pay uh, marketing and advertising agencies are expecting direct response results while they may not be making those choices. Um, They may be making branded advertisement thinking that it's a direct response or making direct response thinking it'll give them a brand lift. The things that helped me uh, understand better how digital advertising could enhance my law firm um, and make it prominent when I was uh, working at Sawoya in Denver, um, the most amazing thing was branded search for me. To think that I had to pay for the keywords of the law firm. Uh, that didn't enter into my mind. Uh, and my previous marketing director who was at the firm was adamant about not spending a dollar on branded search. He said, if they're going to type in your brand name, they're going to click on your ad. But when I uh, started working with Paul um, and Consult Webs, you know, as a vendor at that law firm, yeah. They really opened up my eyes to branded search and how it helped in exposing and getting the calls from the advertising that I was, you know, spreading the, the message around. So I big on TV, big radio presence. Um, yeah. So people didn't quite, maybe they were, you know, maybe they weren't as direct as they could have been in their search. So they type in a couple words with the name and we weren't paying for those, but they were looking for us. And when Paul and I kind of looked at our digital advertising and we switched and I said, let's just try and pay for our branded search terms. And it was like night and day. Uh, the conversions yeah. were strong. Those people knew who we were. They knew that they wanted to call us, but they just needed more information. We weren't paying to show up. When you pay to show up, and you pay to get your message out there, that's when the magic of advertisement happens. But usually people are under-investing or expecting different results from campaigns that aren't aligned with the metrics of the, um, you know, the overall goal. Yeah, I'd say that's and that and that in the nutshell is why people call you the big daddy cane of digital advertising. I've heard that. That's right. Actually. No, no, there's there's no half stepping when <laughs> when when I come into the analytics. <laughs> now then, let me turn to the Michael Bivens of digital advertising, your protege, <laughs> Paul. So Paul, one tactic that's getting a lot of attention is called geofencing, particularly the last year. So what is that? And is targeting hospitals or other locations with this method effective? Full disclosure, I have no idea what any of that means. You guys wrote that question for me. So please go easy on me. <laughs> sure, it, it is a bit of a weird one. So. Um... <laughs> Geofencing is a is a tactic that's primarily used with display campaigns. So you're going to be looking at uh, like banner ads, um, stuff like that. Yeah. And what you can do is you can put in GPS coordinates. So if you knew the GPS coordinates, a good example um, that I like to tell people is, you know, when you go to Target, if you have any coupon apps on your phone, it knows when you walk into Target um, and it starts hitting you with these ads for the different, you know, specials and stuff of the coupon. So geofencing is essentially using GPS coordinates to lay a, a, a perimeter around an area or a building um, or a particular part of the building, depending on how, how um, you know, precise you, you want to get. And when you cross into that fence, it's going to start showing you ads um, on your mobile phone, uh, whether it's through an app or, you know, through a, a search engine or something like that. So, mm-hmm. You know, what we ran into, what, what, what people try, and I think Jake and I, you know, ran a bit of a, a philosophical uh, debate on this one. But, you know, people were targeting, <laughs> saying, hey, let's target the emergency room. Let's target the yeah. emergency room of this hospital with, with ads for a personal injury lawyer. I had someone who pitched the idea of targeting funeral homes with, with wrongful death advertising. So, uh, you know, those are, and, and you can. Morbid, I mean, but it makes sense. I, it, it does. And it's, you know, I, I think it gets a little bit into a bigger thing of, you know, what context do you want your firm uh, represented in? Um, yeah. And kind of what context do you want to be serving ads with a particular message to people? So so it sounds like you're pro geofencing. It's just a matter of like how far you go with that. 
Well, I think it's I think it's a business decision, honestly. I mean, mm. you know, Jake and, and Jake, I'll, you know, jump in here because I know we we've had some back and forth on this, but mm-hmm. the uh, you know, it's it, it's a business decision. Uh, as a marketer, I look at all this available data and and these options and these targeting methods, and um, I'm thrilled. I mean, that's to me, if I can chop out all the stuff that I don't need to pay for and just focus my fire on a very specific, you know, targeting method, that's amazing. Uh, as a consumer, you know, I don't know if I'm in an emergency room that that's the most appropriate time for you to be singling me out. Uh, right. you know? Yeah. Well, and, and to kind of give a counter punch to this geofencing idea is I don't think enough people see precision targeted advertising. It's the point of advertising is so many people see it. And that's how you grow prominence and that's how you grow your brand. Geofencing sort of takes this idea that it's better to take an advertising message to a single person when in reality, advertising in a practice is sort of signaling. It's costly signaling. You're saying, look at this ad. I can afford this ad. I have the means to take care of you. And a lot of people <laughs> yeah. don't think that way in advertising. They think you're going in there to a rational thing and explain something to somebody who's in a funeral home who's like, you know what? This lawyer has a good idea. I don't know how they found my information. That isn't necessarily how it would be. If you had a strong advertising campaign that was broadly um, you know, shared and widely distributed in the network, people who had a wrongful death claim would know I'm going to call the lawyer I know who's in my head, not the lawyer who's in my phone all of a sudden. So I, I, I think geofencing is a great idea. It's a great concept, but it kind of goes against the core idea of branding and getting exposure for your law firm online. More people need to see it, not just one person. That's just my thought. Well, yeah, and to, to just follow ahead, up there, just to, just to confess, um, we've done this. I mean, right. we've absolutely targeted hospitals. <laughs> um, sure. And, and you know, I, I, I don't know that I, I, I guess what I look at is say the data was inconclusive because think of it this way. If you were targeting the entire city block or an entire zip code, which are also options, you know, you'd be covering that hospital anyway. And another point to make with this is that you can't filter out only people who are visiting at the hospital. So you're targeting... Mm. Every single person who mm-hmm. crosses into that fence, every person with a phone, every doctor, yeah. every nurse, every custodial person, all of that stuff. So, you know, the idea of, you know, precision, I think, can be not as precise as, as people uh, imagine it to be. Well, for oh, Yeah, that, no, that's really good discussion here. And Paul, I have to say, did you use Target as your example on purpose? It was a tremendous yes. pun. I just want to yeah. give you credit for that. <laughs> Thank you. I want Thank people you. to Thanks. notice that. Um, I'm trying to get a sponsorship from those fellas, but they, uh, they don't return my calls and, you know, they've sent me some, you know, I call them responses. They call them restraining orders, but it's, you know, a a balance, I think, on on how you look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Shameful. Shameful. The mom and pop stores will be responding to you. Guaranteed. (laughs) You got, you guys got to hit up the Ben Franklin five and 10 cent store. That's, that should be where you go. Oh my God. Yeah. I used to buy all my smoke bombs from them when I was a kid. There you go. Yeah. It was coming back. Um, I think this is a good place to take a break. Why not, right? All right. First half of this podcast, total fire, but it's time for our first break. As I said, here now are some of the things you should buy. If you're missing calls, appointments, and potential clients, it's time to work with Nexus Professional. More than just an answering service, Nexus virtual receptionists are available 24 7 to schedule appointments, qualify leads, respond to emails, integrate with your firm's software, and much, much more. Nexa ensures your clients have the experience they deserve. Give them a call at 800-267-9371 or visit them at nexa.com forward slash podcast for a very special offer. Imagine billing day being the happiest day of the month instead of the day you dread. Nobody went to law school because they love drafting invoices for clients. At TimeSolve, our attorneys save on average over eight hours a month in billing work. That means more billable time and turning billing day into happy day. Learn more about how to get to your time and billing happy place at timesolve.com. That's www.timesolv, leave off the e.com. Remember, that's timesolv.com. 
All right. Thanks for sticking around. Guess what? I found an old milk dud under the couch. So I'm good to go for snacks. And I'm chatting here with Jake Sanders and Paul <laughs> Julius of Consult Webs. We're here talking about paid online advertising for lawyers. You guys have totally had milk duds from under the couch before. I know. Totally. It. Yeah. Um, all right, guys, let's turn to social media, right? Everybody talks about social media, mostly because people are annoyed about their like uncle or grandmother or uh, ex old person in their life tweeting about Donald Trump. But is social media worth advertising on for law firms who want to market formally to legal consumers? Jake, why don't you hit this one? Mm, mm. I, I think it is. Um, I think. Uh, regardless of if you think it's necessary or not, you have to understand that your clients or potential people who could be doing business with you are looking for you. Social media is a great way to sort of describe yourself outside of your resumes, outside of the tightly controlled narratives that we kind of, uh, you know, keep around our business personas. I think a lot of people are wondering what good social media looks like for a lawyer. And uh, I'm, that's a good question. Yeah. I mean, that that really is the, is the end result. What does good mm -hmm. social media look like? I think it looks like regular social media. I think it's you being <laughs> a person and not you selling. Um, I, I have a mentality around the way I use uh, social media, and it's the rule of threes, um, is that you can spend a third of your time talking about the industry of which you are in. Um, a third of your time talking about the vertical, the specific vertical and your disciplines, and then a third of your time selling. Tell people that you represent these clients. Tell them that you do that. Don't do that all the time. Talk about thought leadership, but don't forget selling. Uh, talk about being normal and and you know sharing your your day to day stuff, but don't forget about the clean kind of thought leadership that you have to be cognizant of. So I, I think if you can keep the, the rule of three in mind, just know that you have to be natural and know that people are searching for you. It creates prominence in the search rankings. People will know you. They'll have something to go against. Um, but a lot of lawyers, I think, are, are, are wondering what the ethical considerations are. I don't want to be seen doing this. A lot of lawyers, too, That's on true, Twitter, yeah. it's, it's crickets. When real legal <laughs> stuff hits the fans, you guys don't talk. It's really interesting because you are fence sitters naturally. Well, I'm not going to say he's guilty or innocent or, or it's good or bad, or I'm yeah. not saying it was comparative negligence. I'm not saying that it was this or that. You don't say anything. <laughs> so social media is scared, like a scared world because something you could say could get you dragged or grieved or, you know, the bar association could see this. So my thoughts Keep it light, keep it lively, keep it real, be a person. And those are the lawyers that people are going to be looking for, not some automaton that's selling all the time or somebody who's constantly quoting Tony Robbins or somebody <laughs> who's doing, you know, this or that. You know, it's got to be a blend of of all those things. Jared, you're a good example. Mike Whalen oh, is a good example. Mitch Jackson is a good example. Yep. You know, I wish I knew more about Mitch. I mean, he he's he's really sold on that social stuff, but he has a strong presence and I know it drives business for him. So like Paul was saying earlier, this is all business decisions. But at the end of the day, if you want to stand out and be different, which is digital advertising, which is advertising, which is marketing, social media is fantastic. So don't be scared and take a look at some lawyers who are being humans, awesome, smart, funny. Uh, that, that's, 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 what, that's what the world needs. Hey, Mitch Jackson's got a great backstory. Shout out to Mitch. You guys should talk love to him Mitch. about that at some point. Yeah. Oh, I'm, yeah, love. Yeah. So, Paul, let's turn to you now. Um, so this, I think, is an interesting question. So I think the question we have here is, does lawyer advertising end up elevating awareness of a few law firms at the expense of the legal community at large? So first, do you believe that? And if you don't believe that, how can that perception be changed? Wow. Uh, I know, well, take a breath. Me the easy questions here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, only the easy it. ones um, for you. I, well, no social I, I media think... questions for you, sir. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, does advertising end up elevating the awareness of law firms at the expense of the legal community at large? I don't think so. I think it's very dependent. And that's something that, you know, I know people hate when they say, well, it depends. But it does depend. <laughs> I think it depends on, on, on what you're doing and what you're saying. I think it's important, too, to keep in mind that a lot of the 
the the people who are most critical, um, and Jake and I have looked at uh, uh, one we refer to a lot is the Florida Bar Association survey, um, where they polled all their members and asked them about this, and they said that one of the biggest things that they feel that's giving the legal profession at large a bad reputation is advertising. Um, so I think there's this very kind of internal criticism, but at the same time, you have to realize people aren't making these commercials for other lawyers. They're making it for people. And and, and to go <laughs> yes. even a little bit deeper, they're making it for people who would see something on TV and follow up on that. You know, they're not, not somebody who would, you know, have a, a, a connection in their social group or in their network or something like that that could refer them to a lawyer. So mm-hmm. um, they're trying to reach a very specific demographic. Another thing to keep in mind, too, is that, um, you know, mass media like that is a very comparatively cheap way to reach a large amount of people. So mm-hmm. I, I think some of that is sort of a, a you know, peer criticism, I guess I would say. Um, I, I don't think it necessarily cheapens the industry um, or anything like that. I think there's some maybe misunderstandings in, in general that may be perpetuated by some of this advertising. Um, and, and I think a way to do that is to focus a little more on how people help um, instead of, you know, I've, I've seen some commercials that uh, a- absolutely play on, you know, we're going to get you, you know, interact, get a check or, you know, stuff like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that's memorable. I mean, I remembered it now. Um, but that's not necessarily, I've seen some other ads where the attorney or the, the, the group in general is very personable. Uh, they're very local focused. They're very focused on your rights and the things that they can do to help you out. Uh, you know, I know Jake, Jake and I have talked about, you know, how I think lawyers can forget how isolated people can be, particularly when they, and how intimidating it can be to have an insurance company you know, telling you this is going to happen and you do this or that. Um, And, you know, if, if you reach out to somebody who says, I'll fight for you. And I have a a history of fighting and winning for people just like you. Mm -hmm. I I think that's a valid thing to say. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, well, and and you think, well, why? So it was 81% of lawyers polled think that attorney advertising negatively impacts the public's perception of the legal profession. Overwhelmingly, lawyers just believe this. Oddly enough, asking lawyers who advertise themselves, do they think lawyer advertisements have a negative impact? 85% of them agreed. Yeah, which is why, crazy. Why, why, what is it? What, what is it that's, that's preventing us from either understanding these business decisions or trying to correct uh, the way the public perceives this profession. In regards to bar associations doing something to help uh, the way lawyers are perceived in public, there was a case in Wisconsin where the bar association was going to use the dues to create a whole bunch of TV commercials about lawyers in Wisconsin helping make the, you know, the world a better place, you know, doing veteran outreach stuff with social security. um, And a lawyer sued them and said, no way you're not taking my money (laughs) and making these TV commercials that make it seem like we're good because I get to tell you what you do with my money. And, and sounds about right. And you're like, okay, you're right. You're right. Okay. They are your dues. But isn't it interesting that when faced with an opportunity to create advertisement that corrects the public's perception of a negative profession, they shoot it down with a lawsuit. It, it, it's funny because Jim Adler, the hammer, uh, Texas law hawk, um, you know, Frank Azar here in Colorado, there's Frank D'Andrico or whatever. There's several strong arms, several Mm -hmm. hammers, several eagles, several gorillas. There's a pirate (laughs) lawyer in Las Vegas. Mm. The fact is, is these guys have made a branded decision that they know creates salience in the minds of consumers. And so consumers love pirates. It's totally true. Well, but it's like, uh, you know, I want to get that guy and he's going to mop the poop deck of these insurance agents. <laughs> well, I would have gone with and Walk the Plank, but that's viable. I was, I just, I thought I would go there. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> no going back. Um, we're in uncharted <laughs> waters. The point is, 
like does advertising impact the negative profession? The point is lawyers are making boring, tepid, safe, underinvested advertising campaigns and expecting something different. They're expecting a change. And the people who are paying big for TV, paying big for digital advertising are eating everybody's lunch. Yeah. So the point is, is you can complain about this or you can stand out, make a kick, make an ad that kicks butt that de- that <laughs> defines who you thank are. You. Thank you. I'm sorry. All the bar and, associations but, across America. Thank you. But you know what I'm saying? It's your chance to know that you just have to get noticed. No one yeah. knows you. No one cares. Yep. Your quality of work, your legal advocacy, no one cares. You have access to the same case law your competitors do. There's no way that you could possibly turn it around in any different way or write a different writ or do a different demand. You could probably change the way you phrase things. What you need to do is work on branding. What you need to do is work on your client experience and understand that come with a brand commitment, be unique and differentiated and do something that gets noticed. Everyone's making boring ads, you know, and then you're dogging on a hammer, you know, on Jim Adler. He is in Curacao right now laughing at you. Um, (laughs) No, no, it's totally true. You know, it's funny. I I think some of the things that people forget about this too, is that like lawyer advertising as a, as like a thing that you can do has only been around for like 45 years. So it's, it's not like 80s. this is like a mature industry. Yeah, right. exactly. It's in the 80s is when it started. We talked to Harlan Schillinger, who's one of the first advertisers who started that in Colorado, you know, started legal advertising. The first TV commercial was yeah. shot. And one of the best TV commercials I've ever seen um, what came out of Colorado and it was a lawyer standing in front of a courtroom just saying, blah, 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 blah. And the tagline was like, you know, we know that you think we sound like this, but you you need a lawyer, you know? And it was it was hilarious. It was funny. It made fun. It was self-deprecating. There was yeah. something there. You know, um, those are the those are the ads that me and Paul love. Um, those are the, you know, the marketing campaigns that we really cherish. Um, if you want to make money and be quick and strong and whatever, that's fine. You just got to know that that is going to get a response. Like Paul was saying, you have somebody say they're going to fight for me? Great. You have somebody who says I have 200 years of combined legal experience and I'm reliable? <laughs> uh, I'm well, like okay. a horseless carriage. You know, and, and, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, totally. I mean, something that I think, you know, Jake and I really key in on a lot um, is that there's a book called Hey Whipple, Squeeze This. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's all about classic advertising and stuff. And, and the point is, you know, that Charmin commercial, Mr. Whipple, was wildly, wildly successful. I mean, yeah. for years. Oh, people and the hate thing it. is, people <laughs> hated him. I hate mean, Mr. So Whipple. Absolutely hated him. <laughs> Screw that guy. Yep. Totally. But it Squeeze worked. that Charmin. Yep. <laughs> but it worked, yeah. All right, that's a good note to end on. Let's take okay. a break in segment two. <laughs> Everybody, in case you forgot, maybe you have, I'm talking with Jake Sanders and Paul Julius of Consult Webs. Let's take another break before we come back again. In the meantime, listen to some more words from our sponsors. Your legal work requires your full attention. So how can you build lasting relationships with new or existing clients while juggling your caseload? Try Abby Connect, the friendly, highly trained and motivated live receptionists who are well known for providing consistent quality customer service and support to law firms just like yours. Every connection matters. So call Abby Connect today at 833-ABBY-WOW to get started with your free 14-day trial and $95 off your first bill. Do you feel like your marketing efforts aren't getting you the high-value cases your firm deserves? For over 15 years, Scorpion has helped thousands of law firms just like yours to attract new cases and to grow their practices. As a Google Premier Partner and winner of Google's Platform Innovator Award, Scorpion has the right resources and technology to aggressively market your law firm and to generate better cases from the internet. For more information, visit scorpionlegal.com forward slash podcast today. All right, thanks for coming back, everybody. Guess what? We're at the third part of the podcast. I know that the third part of a trilogy is often a mixed bag, but we're going to close this out like it was Back to the Future part three. So let's get back to our conversation with Jake Sanders and Paul Julius of Consult Webs. We're talking about paid advertising 
for law firms. So I think this is pretty interesting that you guys had been in a vendor client relationship prior to taking on your current roles. Um, I believe Paul was at uh, Consult Webs and Jake was at the law firm, and then he had mm-hmm. his own consultancy. So is there anything you guys can pass along that you learned from that relationship, like tips for working together, setting expectations, things you hate about each other? <laughs> Paul, Paul, you want to go? <laughs> I'm, I'm. Hang on, I'm, I'm on number fifteen on this yeah, list. Yeah, well, how of long is I your hate. list? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. So Jake, obviously, we work together now. So we had a great relationship, you know, from from the start, pretty much. Um, I think communication and transparency is very important, and and I learned that uh, a lot with Jake was that, you know, as the marketing director at this law firm. He was responsible, you know, not only for the work I was doing, uh, and we were doing at Consult Webs, but you know, uh, all across the board, their TV ads, billboards, all that stuff, and communicating that to the stakeholders at the firm uh, was was a big part of uh, you know what he needed to do. So a lot of what we were talking about, it wasn't that he didn't understand; it was that we needed to make things digestible and explainable to you know people who maybe didn't have the same in-depth knowledge of how advertising and and online marketing and stuff like that worked. So Mm -hmm. it was important to say, you know, here's what we did, here's why we did it, and here's what we expected. And then being honest and just looking at those results, because every time um, we needed to refer back to something, when, when someone didn't know, you always have the numbers there. And, and people can get numbers. If you can show them, you know, A plus B equaled C, then you don't have to talk about, you know, impression share and, you know, impressions per conversion and, you know, perceived value. Like that's, those are vanity metrics. Let's talk about you spent this much, it led to this, which led to this much coming back. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that Jake was very, very good with that. And another thing I learned from Jake was the importance of brand awareness. And he touched on this earlier, but we had some really, really long kind of soul searching conversations about where ads were placed. And and this came out when, um, you know, YouTube, uh, I think it was, was it Chrysler? Maybe it was, um, basically mm-hmm. they found out that, that their ads on YouTube were showing, uh, like before ISIS beheading videos. And so yep. they pulled all their advertising off there and then mm-hmm. GE did. Um, and, and everybody was like, Whoa, Hey, you know, this isn't, this isn't the precision targeting you told us. So, that became very important because, you know, at the firm from his side, they worked very, very hard to build and maintain this reputation and respect in the community. And, you know, one or two bad placements that, that somebody takes a screenshot and posts on Twitter can undo all of that. So, um, yeah, I think that was yeah. very, very important. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, I, I think the truth is I came into that law firm as a social media guy, I was just going to be tweeting and Facebooking and being funny, um, coming up with some good ideas. And then they fired the director. Yeah. And because I had found out, you know, just kind of like poking through, there was tons of like, you know, um, projects that were just kind of up in the air. Nothing was really landing. And, and mm. I just was sort of asking questions. And then it <laughs> led to his oust, um, his ousting. And then they said, do you think you can handle it? And I was like, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. and so the, the answer is the answer is no, but yes. And and what I realize is that I'm a musician. My college degree is in jazz performance. Um, I, that, Much like these all, podcasts. Well, yes. but all I do is <laughs> all, all I do is basically my life has been creatively expressing myself and either getting shot down or having people explode in thunderous applause. And so my life has been this sort of bipolar, um, accept me and let me work on something so you can accept it. So marketing and advertising is sort of a a natural form for a creative person like me. But when I had to take over the director of marketing position, I couldn't be the creative person anymore. I couldn't just aim for likes. I couldn't aim for vanity metrics. And so I threw myself- I, well, I threw myself at everything I could understand. Um, George Brinker, marketing ethics, Byron Sharp, you know, how brands grow. I, you know, I went deep and learned as much as I could about marketing. And I went into my firm. I, I 
like saw my sales and intake process. I tried to track the leads. Then I reported on the leads. Then we reported them against average case fees. And then we talk about settlements and then we talk about return on investments. And I created this Excel spreadsheet that looked like uh, it was just, a. I didn't know a jazz performance major could do these things. Um, <laughs> when I showed it to them, they were like, they were blown away. They had never seen um, this level of trackability, accountability, transparency. And it was with Paul helping me define what I was looking for. And then me going into the law firm and questing for those not vanity metrics, the things that talk about revenue, the things that talk about profit, they wouldn't let me in. Um, but slowly they started to realize that I could help them. And so then I started to become a part of the media buying. And then I started becoming part of the creative process. And but it had to start from a place of stupidity. I couldn't have done <laughs> any of that without knowing that I was dumb about marketing, knowing that I was dumb about finances and advertising and stuff. And we made, uh, I mean, it was, it was amazing. The improvements that we made, the, we, we overhauled the website. I mean, rankings were just through the roof. Um, campaigns were just rocking, you know, thousands of times at ROI percentage. And that's the truth. But it only happened when Paul and Jake came together. You can have a great vendor and a great leader, but if they don't come together, you know, you can have a great CRM or you can have a great Excel uh, document or whatever it is, case management system. But if there isn't a person running it and a person responsible on the other side for helping connect it, all your advertising and marketing things are going to be just dead in the water. And it's just going to be another dream that you had. So the point was, come from that place, empty headedness, know that you may succeed. People may laugh at you or they may clap, but you are going to do the work and make sure you have the numbers that go beyond something that's just a vanity metric because that that's just how I had to prove my life. And, and those experiences have kind of blossomed into our relationship and the way that we help people think about marketing and advertising. I talked to my law firm. I said, how's the lead tracking going? They're not keeping up on the leads. They're, they're not doing what I was doing. They're not tracking. They're not following up. They're yeah. not connecting the marketing. Um, and so that's, that, that can be frustrating to hear. Are they, are they struggling? No. Could you make money and not know where it's coming from? Sure. Um, but you know, it's, <laughs> you've just it's, described it's just, law firms in general, <laughs> yeah, but, but it's just massively better to have someone who cares. And if you're not there and you don't care, uh, none of this stuff is going to matter. You know? God damn, so, what a beautiful story. Hold on, let yeah. me wipe my eye. Um, <laughs> well, all right, let, let's segue into the next section, which is where this is partly going. So like this idea of like accessing resources for better understanding on this topic. Mm -hmm. Can you guys recommend resources for people listening to the show if they want to dive into this topic as well, in addition to what you've already talked about? For sure. Yeah, I, I would go to consultwebs.com and look at our nutrition guide. Oh, nice. Um, we, have to take we've, a look created, at that. we've created something called the Legal Marketing Nutrition Guide, and it basically is a primer to help people understand two factors in regards to making your business more profitable. You have to grow your brand, and you have to activate sales. So I think when I came into marketing, I was all about culture and messaging and just about brand stuff but I wasn't about sales. And then I went hard into sales, but I was neglecting the brand. So the whole idea is that through marketing science, Andrew Ehrenberg, Byron Sharp, people from uh, the, uh, it's IPA. Um, it's a European think group that does advertising and marketing research. Hmm. They've studied consumer behaviors and they've figured out the science on how brands grow. I've taken all that and transmutated it into a marketing metaphor um, in the legal marketing nutrition guide. It's everything that I think of and believe in, in regards to marketing. And it's right there. Consult webs uh, helped me make it with our coders. We, we designed it. We made it look beautiful. You can download your report to figure out if you're balancing in between growth and sales and how you can um, achieve that. Because that is a consolidation of all of the inspiration and books that I've read um, so I would suggest people go there. That sounds awesome. Paul, any additional suggestions? I, I got nothing, man. I'm just riding on Jake's coattails. <laughs> <laughs> no. You got something? Go ahead. No, I was just, well, I was just going to throw out a couple things. I'm giving you the floor. The floor is yours. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Definitely go to consultwebs.com. 
But if you're looking to get a little bit deeper into specifics of digital advertising, perhaps some of the different methods, mm -hmm. um, Google itself, Google Ads has a has a great course you can go through, oh, yeah. get certified. It's a great place to start. Same thing with Bing. And I would say the, the last thing you can do is uh, you got to get in there and get your hands dirty. So, you know, mm -hmm. at some point, uh, you know, Try yes. and set yourself up a little campaign, figure out how these things work, set some expectations, try and meet them. No better, you know, substitute than there, there, there's no better teacher than experience here, I think. So mm -hmm. that's my recommendation. All right, Paul, you ready? This is your moment to shine. You okay. get the last question. Oh, really? Yes. Yes. This is my new segment. It's called Tweets You Forget About. We're in. I read back an old tweet of yours and you comment on it. Are you ready? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, brother. Okay. It's not going to be bad. I promise. Okay. And I'm glad you're ready because that was a rhetorical question I was going to ask you anyway. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, here's your tweet from March 27, 2019. I still can't believe someone pitched the idea. Let's let 100 cats loose in Ikea and see what happens. And got it approved. I watched this video. The fact is that really a whole lot didn't happen. The cats kind of just loitered as cats would do. They didn't even build a single piece of furniture. So, Paul, my question for you is, what would have happened if Ikea had released Ligers instead? Oh, man. Um, well, you know that that Flug bookcase would have been built in about five seconds, man. <laughs> Flug. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't know. I was so blown away that that somebody, I, whoever would would have pitched that, whatever their marketing agency was, like I just want to find those guys and be like, what's next? Like, can we, you know, yeah. what what we want to do is lower the president of this company into a live volcano with a GoPro <laughs> on, um, wearing nothing but an IKEA speedo. I like how you went to human sacrifice next. Well played. That escalated quickly. <laughs> I, it's a logical step. I mean, at least for me, I don't know. You guys, oh, is certainly. there something different? I mean, is that is that weird? No, no I think that's weird. Well, I, I was yeah. going to ask Jake because I can't resist. Like, Jake, I want to give you a hypothetical animal too. Yeah. Loose yeah. an Ikea. A griffin. Yeah. How would a murder of griffins <laughs> have torn up an Ikea in your estimation? So, so being born from the mother griffin, which is Merv griffin. <laughs> um <laughs> Right, who, correct. Who was very amazing, very dynastic in the way he presented game shows. You may remember Merv Griffin one, Productions, baby. I'm all over uh, it. So, you know, that uh, we're talking Price is Right. We're talking, I mean, what else? You know, but Every Plinko. Every cool game show ever. Oh. Price is Right. Griffins have, uh, uh, and also they have a taste for lingonberries. <laughs> is that so? so? I, 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 would, I would be a little concerned because they are a Grecian sort of a mutant animal. I'm assuming they're from Greece. Um, I think so. I'm not sure. Lingonberry might upset their tum. Uh, <laughs> could have some problems. Um, and Griffin cleanup is probably going to be your biggest problem there. It's going to be gnarly. Um, so I think that's the perfect segue to end the show. Um, <laughs> that's how we try and end ours. <laughs> Good Griffin talk. Mm -hmm. We've reached the end of yet another episode of the Legal Toolkit Podcast. This was a podcast about digital advertising for law firms, and we've been talking with Jake Sanders and Paul Julius of Consult Webs. Now, I'll be back on future shows with further insights into my soul, the soul of America and the legal market. If you're feeling nostalgic for my dulcet tones, however, you can check out our entire show archive anytime you want at LegalTalkNetwork.com. So thanks again to my guests today, Jake Sanders and Paul Julius for Consult Webs for making their appearances today. All right, Jake, Paul, can you tell everyone how they can find out more about Consult Webs and the Lawsome podcast as well? Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Consult Webs can be found on the internet at www.consultwebs.com. Lawsome podcast can be found. It's thelawsomepodcast.com, or you can look us up on iTunes, Android, Stitcher, anywhere. Anywhere, anywhere that... You get that this stuff. would all be on the internet. It's a beautiful it is. thing. It's there. It was. Uh, <laughs> we made a we made a choice to go. It was it was that or uh, smoke signals, and we decided that internet. There was a future in internet. Would have been real yeah. disappointing if we ended this thing and you guys didn't have a website. So thank God for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks again to Jake Sanders and Paul Julius of Consult Webs. Finally, thanks to you out there, all of you out there, for listening. This has been the Legal Toolkit Podcast, where it's always on like Donkey Kong.
Thanks for listening to Legal Toolkit, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Join host Jared Correa for his next podcast covering the current business trends for law firms. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.